Welcome back to Sunday Live. Naji Balala, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Jumping straight into it. Last year, you took the docket of mining, a serious docket, yeah. and said, I'm cancelling licenses. Shortly thereafter, accusation that you had demanded a bribe from a company called Cortec. That is, in, that is in court. You can give us a comment on that, but also tell us, where are you in streamlining the process of the issuance of licenses? Definitely, uh, Julie. Anybody who cancelled their license, they got it irregular, yeah? How would they respond? they will react harshly. And my record speaks for itself. So you cancel a license. What we say is that if you think you're aggrieved, come to the task force. They never came to the task force. So their license were, were given on the 7th of March, the day of election. Mm. How valid would it be? A license given on the day of election. There's no minister, there's no government. We are an in incoming government. It's not going to be valid. So. Anyway, it's in court. We hope it will be resolved amicably. Okay, so th that continues and we're limited as to how much we can say about it. But let's talk about the issue. But right I want now. to say also something yes. else. that The task force completed their report. We have seen all those licenses we have cancelled. We have s a few of them who are approved. We approved them. The others, we told them, apply afresh with new documentation. So we gave a fair play for everybody. So anybody who had issues, maybe missing documents or some and procedural systems in place, please come and apply again. We give you another chance. But with Cortec, they did not want to follow that. The they processes. Wanted to f they didn't want to follow the process. They went to court. So we said, okay, we respect the court. And we are government respecting the courts. We will respect what the judge The courts will, will rule. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk processes and transparency. Because there's certainly a feeling that Kenya, like many other African countries, is enriched with resources diverse resources and you hear of companies mining here mining there yes. gold uh, you know all kinds of things but how can the citizenry access information as to who is mining what you know um, what kind of you know revenues yeah. are these companies earning mm -hmm. and what do they give back to the co the government and the local communities first of all you uh, Julie uh, the last law was created 70 years ago, 1930. Yeah? So every time, 20 years process of changing the law, every time it reaches to parliament, it gets derailed. So vested interests around the mining, mining sector derail the process. We have decided no more. Now the law is in the, in the floor of the house. In the next few weeks, it will be debated. We hope we have a proper, modern, progressive law. Mm -hmm. That shows three things as a principle, transparency. We, we want to show accountability in terms of, 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 of uh, mining sector. Revenues and coming in and, 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 and earnings. Yes. And then the third one is equity for our people. Yes. If it doesn't benefit our country, why should we extract it? Because the extractive industries are known globally, not just in Kenya or in Africa, to be highly um, exploitative industries and and marikana in south africa yes. is a prime example of what happens yes. when people feel exploited mm -hmm. conflict mm -hmm. ensues mm -hmm. now oil and water not directly under your docket but yes. let's have a talk about turkana yes. and the fact that we can see all the potential in turkana mm -hmm. the community is worried the inequity mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. their stake in this mm -hmm. and and also it doesn't seem to have Timelines. Everybody's asking mm -hmm. when will we see, um, mm -hmm. you know, the fruits uh, mm -hmm. of the wealth that this uh, county has. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Uh, first of all, on that? Uh, minerals and oils and gas is under the national government mm -hmm. as per the new constitution. Uh, but definitely, we need the community to benefit. So we are working on now on a framework that the community must benefit some percentage. So that will be announced very soon. Yeah. So the community can be able to feel a difference in their lives. If it does, they don't feel a difference. They will not have ownership of the project. So they will not support the project. And we want them to support the project, to buy in. So what we are saying here is that these resources will come to the national, nas national government. They'll be distributed the way the CRA or the Commission for Revenue Allocation is doing for distribution of resources for counties. So that will be done in the appropriate manner. Who is working on that? 
Well, we are working jointly with the Ministry of Energy, my ministry, and CRA and the Treasury to make sure that the distribution process is transparent and everybody knows what belongs to them. Mm -hmm. The only thing there is a lot of anxiety, and we have seen in 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 in, in Ukambani, yeah, the, the the coal project. We don't want to create so much anxiety that it it stops the projects from going on. We are now ready with the company that won the tender to extract coal, but there's so much controversies, court, court cases after court cases. Then the project will not be exploited in time to benefit the country, but benefit the people on the ground. There will be a, a mechanism of consultation, yeah? But everybody should know that this is a national national asset. It's not just for one single community. Right, it's to be it's benefited for, uh, every, What happened to, let's country. say, mm -hmm. let's assume Mandera doesn't produce oil or doesn't produce coal or any mineral. Would they be left out to benefit from this resource? No, we can't do that. We have to make sure everybody benefits in the country. And yet local communities definitely want to feel they have a bigger no, stake. But, but here, in, here, yes. here, the position of government, they must this extraction must benefit immediately the local community. Right. So apart from jobs, apart from uh, development infrastructure, and there'll be some resources left behind for the community. L let's stay on this uh, focus on local community, but let's take a different approach and, and look at the environment yes. and the environmental degradation that comes with many of these mm -hmm. extractive mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. industries. And um, if you just look at uh, a study done by, um, I quote this a lot, the Society for International Development, which builds Africa scenarios mm -hmm. and has definitely said, particularly for our region, our wealth lies in the appropriate use of our resources. That's we right. cannot overmine we yes. cannot deplete what we have yeah. do we have a structured plan when it comes to issues of environmental degradation and the amount of mining that can happen mm -hmm. in any mm -hmm. particular mm -hmm. area first of all in the new bill that we are having it in Parliament the mining bill is we have an issue of environmental issues despite environment is mentioned is, is, is the docket is being held by NEMA but we are going to create another set of laws that talks about mine health safety and environment right. this is all over the world is being practiced that you separate the normal environmental issues to mine health safety and environment because there is the safety of the workers the health element of the workers and then there's the environmental issues after the mining is done we are talking about rehabilitation bonds here so that you have to deposit some money mm -hmm. so that if you don't do it then this money will be utilized and there should be a structured way of how to administer uh, these, these these rehabilitation programs. I have established now a directorate in charge of mine health and safety, so that will an environment, so that we'll be looking at all the environmental issues. Because tomorrow, these mining companies will pack because they are they're not making any money. They'll they'll vanish, and will remain with a hole. And that hole will be dangerous to our people who are living next to it. Very interesting. A lot of the so southern African companies yes. that have been mining there are looking east yes, and yes. heading this way, packing up and leaving the mines there, just as you said. Julie, Africa pr is 50% producer of minerals in the world, the continent of Africa. Why are we languishing in poverty? So let me ask you this question. At, at an Africa level, there's a big discussion about African countries coming together mm -hmm. and agreeing on common terms. Mm -hmm. So that when companies come into mine, they can't play Tanzania off Kenya. Or Julie, are I'm we doing chair, this? I'm the chairman of the Southern Eastern African Mining Com uh, 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 Center. Uh, I've just come from uh, Addis Ababa, African Union. I met with Zuma. Uh, the president of AU, and we have agreed on the African Mining Development Center. And we can have uniformity in terms of physical regimes, uniformity in terms of the legal region. Because today, if I invite a company to Kenya and I tell them these are my rules, every day they'll tell me Tanzania is better right. than you. Right. So I have to compete against my neighbor, yeah, while we are, we are not complementing each other. We are actually destroying each other every day. So I have been to Addis two weeks ago in negotiating that we now come as a continent and the African Union takes a lead so that we can be able to have uniformity in, in laws and in the physical incentives for this sector. Well, you're not going to leave us. We're going to still be with you for a while. Before we go to our next story on Somalia, I do want to ask you, yes. it was heavy politics for you for many years, Najib. Now you're a cabinet secretary and officially out of the world of politics, we are told. That's not true. Is, That's it's not, not true. true. 
Tell us. I am delivering government policies and, and, and the Jubilee government promise. That is a political promise. Okay. So it, I'm not going to be in a political rally propagating my party's agenda. That is now politics. I'm not going to be competing and shouting match on political agendas. No. I will be propagating the government agenda. And if you want to term it politics or not politics, my, my, my subject here is to deliver the promises of the Jubilee government. Is it a more comfortable or uncomfortable role than the political role? Well, uh, the well. active <laughs> political role you played previously? Well, uh, public service is, is the same. But the difference here, maybe I don't have the headaches of every day waking up and addressing personal issues of the constituency. Mm -hmm. That's the only difference. Mm -hmm. But at times you miss such, such, such you nagging miss issues. You miss the connection. Yes, And, the connection and I must tell people. you, people have said to me on Twitter, Julie, tell, uh, tell the cabinet secretary, we're trying to get hold of him. We want to meet with him. So they're looking for you. <laughs> we'll come back. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back in just a short while. Uh, and we've got with us the um, Somali ambassador to Kenya, Mohammed Ali Noor. Welcome to Sunday Live. Thank you for making time to be with us at a critical time for both our nations in this country and it's been about two decades of strife in Somalia finally due to in part due the, to the assistance from national forces from Uganda Kenya and various other countries our Amisom forces on the ground as well we're able to see some stability in the country and of course now in Kenya there is this move to repatriate Somalians back home. Give us, let's start there, give us your thoughts on this effort. Uh, first of all, thank you, Julie, for having me uh, tonight. Uh, uh, on behalf of my government and people, uh, we are thankful for the Kenyan government and its people for allowing over 500,000 Somali refugees uh, to be here in Kenya over 20 years. Um, and also, they are, uh, um, we have signed a tribal agreement uh, last year uh, in November. Uh, between Somalia, Kenya, and UNHCR. Mm -hmm. In the agreement itself, uh, it says that uh, the, the two countries and UNHCR will help the Somali refugees who are willing to go back to Somalia voluntarily. I want to underline voluntarily uh, that we will help them. Uh, the Somali government will make sure that the cities where they are going are safe, and the Somali government will prepare the schools and, and the necessity things that they want to go to uh, when they go back uh, to Somalia. Uh, in the agreement itself, it also says, uh, where we all sign, that the uh, Kenyan government uh, will allow the other Somali uh, refugees who want to stay behind in Kenya until uh, 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 they are willing to go back. Uh, have, having said that, mm -hmm. uh, us and Kenya, uh, we are part and sign the uh, UN refugee uh, convention laws, and, and that's why they are here. You've mentioned the tripartite arrangement, and, and you've, you've mentioned setting up you know, safe areas for them to come back. Let's talk about the repatriation itself. What happens when somebody's actually sent back to Somalia? What can they expect on the ground? What, what in the agreement itself was that we, uh, the two governments and UNHCR, will um, set up commissions, which we did. Um, and, uh, and in the end of, the, of this month, uh, the, uh, we're supposed to go back to Mogadishu and start uh, that commission will be uh, start uh, working uh, where we will prepare and, and see uh, places, safe areas where uh, the refugees who want to go back voluntarily will go back to Somalia. Th for those who have gone back, where are they now? Uh, some went back actually last year and this year uh, voluntarily went back to different parts of Somalia. Um, in Mogadishu, Kismayo, uh, you know, other areas uh, they went back to and the government helped them uh, with the help, of course, with, with the international community. Let's talk about Kasarani now and the exercise. And the government has come out strongly and said it is going to intensify efforts. This exercise is not going to stop. Um, let's talk about that for a moment and your thoughts on that, particularly with respect to the concerns that have been raised over profiling. Uh, we, we have discussed that with the Kenyan government. Of course, Kenya government is a sovereign country. Uh, they can ask documents to any foreign a person who is in Kenya, uh, what we are against uh, is the profiling of Somalis. Uh, we are against that. Uh, Somali, uh, Somalis themselves are victims of Shabab. Uh, that's one of the reasons that they ran away from Somalia. Uh, and of course, we condemn the acts of terrorism that took place in Nairobi, Isli, and, and, and in the coast also. And we, uh, our condolences go to the family who lost their lives, innocent people, mm -hmm. uh, the, the killing that took place in the church and other places. Uh, that doesn't mean that all Somalis are terrorists, uh, also all Muslims. 
you know, we are Muslims, uh, Islam is for peace. These people, Shabab, what they are preaching is not Islam. Let me, let me bring that to you, Najib, and, and it's great to still have you in the studio. Give us a Muslim perspective as, as, as a leader in the, in the community. I'm sure you're seen that way, but also as a leader in government. What are your thoughts on the situation faced by the government right now? You need to crack down. National security is a key issue. We've seen such tragic and horrific attacks. At the same time, there are concerns around profiling. How, how do you address this? First of all, the propagation of killing others is not Islam. And I grew up as a Muslim, I'm a Muslim, I'm religious, but I never saw this religion that is being propagated now. These people are not propagating Islam. So this is a new religion is coming. So it's not an Islamic religion. Mm. We have a challenge as a country. We need to address the issue of terrorism and security. We have no choice but to do, to do everything possible to eradicate the terrorists in our country. It's unfortunate that it has to be done but how do we do it? We need to handle it carefully. Right. Because profiling any community, leave about Muslims or, or Somalis, profiling any communities is not democratic. It is not human right as well. But it must be done properly. What we are doing as a government, we want to assure everybody that the government is going to make sure everything is done with a human face. Mm -hmm. The government is not profiling Muslims, is not profiling Somalis. We want to clean up the good name of the Somalis who are city, living here legally. Government wants to, to make sure that the Muslims who are proper, they are safeguarded because the victims are Somalis, the victims are in our regions in the Muslim areas. Let me, let me ask this, um, uh, you know, and, and I ask this as, as a Muslim leader. How is it that this radicalization has been bred within the mosques and how do you then address that from the community itself? Uh, How do the moderates uh, step up and say, this is not what we believe Islam to be, as you are doing tonight? But, 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 but Julie, first of all, this is a new in indoctrination of religion is coming in and is looking at people who are vulnerable, people who are young, youth, people who are poor, and people who are lacking education both secular education and religious education. If you learn the Islamic or the Islamic religious education does not propagate killing of any nature, it must respect and be tolerant of all religions and all races. Its human beings must be respected. So this, this, is, this is a new way of propagation, of, of trying to bring havoc and bring this, this, this suspicion between the two religions. I believe there is, there is a bigger picture into dividing the country on the tri religious world. And I've seen right, this. It's right. happening in Nigeria. Targeting the churches. Yes, oh, yes. Yeah. It's, it's happening in Nigeria, mm -hmm. the Boko Haram. Mm -hmm. It's happening in Central Africa. Muslims are being slaughtered and genocide there. Yeah? It's happened in Somalia. It's, it, it's even intended to be happening in Kenya. We as government must put a stop to it. Let, let me come to you, Mohammed, yeah. on this. And, and Somalia suffered, I mean, as, as some of these cities were freed, there was this feeling of, you know, absolute delight and, 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 and you know, you could see the suffering that the ordinary Somali had endured for, for decades. So tell us a little bit about the insights that you have learned in terms of the radicalization and how are you addressing any cells or units that still remain in Somalia today? You know, now uh, there's an uh, uh, offensive move uh, by Somali uh, uh, military forces uh, with the help of AMSOM uh, contributing countries' forces, including KDF. And uh, we are really cleaning up the whole country. Uh, Shabab is losing. Uh, that's why... Where will they go, do you think? What is their next step? Yeah, as that, they, yes. yeah th th that's why, you know, uh, uh, these this attacks are not happening in, in Nairobi or in Mombasa. They're trying to really create enemy. Somalis and, and Kenya population. Somali people here came here over 20 years. They do business. They are lower abiding people. They pay taxes. They are peace loving people in Sli, in Mombasa, and other places. When this thing happens, of course, themselves, they are against it. You remember what, what happened in Westgate? I myself went and, and gave blood. Somalis in Sli followed me. They went into lines. People, Somali refugees in the Dab, refugee camp, they went in lines to show support and solidarity with Kenyan people that they are against Shabab. It's not fair for them that this crackdown now, that they have been humiliated, that they, that what happened to them is not fair. And we have complained to the Kenyan government, and the Kenyan government have promised us
that this will stop. Gentlemen, I'm going to come to you with the solutions. We've got to close in the next few minutes. So, uh, Mohammed, your solution, then I'll come to you, Najib, for yours. So what is the way forward? How would you advise the Kenyan government then to deal with the situation? The way forward is, uh, of course, Kenya government and Somali government are two friendly countries. Or two head of states meet regularly. Uh, they met over 10 times uh, in, in Nairobi and other places. We work closely with the Kenya security agencies. We want that co to continue. But what we are appealing is that to stop this profiling of Somalis, that they have to be treated well. And even when they are taken to police stations, that they have to be treated well. And the refugees to be respected. And, 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 and we want them to be, not to be humiliated. Okay, but you remain partners in the, the effort to then take those who are willing to go back home, Definitely. back home and settle them in. Najib, what is the solution? Well, first, I want to make it very categorically here. The government is not in the business of profiling any community. Mm -hmm. But we need to beef up security. And we need to beef up security, even if there's a challenge like in this league, we need to handle it very carefully and with human face. And I want to tell everybody, if any policeman is caught in rep or any against the law should be if reported. there's any mistreatment. Mm -hmm. Mistreatment should be reported and we will take action as government. Mm -hmm. The second issue, Julie, we have broken the structures of intelligence. It's not working anymore. I remember in, this, in the 80s and 90s, we talked about the Chiefs Act, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a draconian act that uh, the chief is forcing people to give the chicken. Yeah, it we belittled it so much, we weakened the intelligence system of the national government. Today, we don't have those structures in place. Maybe it's a high time for us, all of us as a country, to look at how do we empower the intelligence system from the chief's level to the headsman's level, to the district commissioner, to the county commissioner, so that we can know these things before they happen, right. so that we can prevent uh, incidents to take we place. We stop being reactive. Yes. So, so th we need to address these issues. Nowadays, terrorism is sophisticated uh, war. And we need to start as a government and as a police and as a community. You know, security is not about the police and the government. Mm. It's about the people as well. Mm. The Nyumbuk Nyumbakumi concept is a real good one that we, meet, we must all embrace so that we can be able to help ourselves in living a better life. So we need to look at the entire intelligence system so that we can be able to address the issue of terrorism. It's sophisticated, it's tough. We, were going, we are going to be firm, but we need to address the issue of democracy, human rights, and all those issues that we uh, embrace as a government. Okay, thank you for that. Also, technology, I think we... Technology yeah, is key. Key. Thank you, gentlemen. We, let's take a look at what was happening in London today before we let you all go. We're going to revisit our earlier story on the London Marathon, and we have footage that has just come in of First Lady Margaret Kenyatta finishing the race. Now, our senior reporter, Eden Waboy, was at the finish line, and she brings us the story of a happy ending of a long race featuring the First Lady being received by none other than her husband, President Uhuru Kenyatta. Let's have a look. Kenyatta has done it. 
and in seven hours and four minutes. A fit that is as befitting as that of our Kenyan athletes, whose win has made Kenya proud once again. Evelyn Omboy, Citizen TV in London. Well, thanks. You know, I think we're so related, Somalia and Kenya. I'm going to ask you for a comment on that. What, what, what do you think when you see that? Well, it's very, actually, it's very uh, uh, breathtaking and, 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 and what, what the first lady did, and it's a very good thing. Wow. Uh, Najib, what are your thoughts? <laughs> first of all, uh, the cause the first lady has taken is a great cause. Mm -hmm. And uh, for her as, uh, as, as, as a big name and a fast family, to be uh, on the cause and, and running in London, I think it shows how humble uh, both the president and uh, the first lady. Uh, look at the president, he was very interactive. He, he says, how are you good people? Mm, very yeah. proud, it very seems, proud, of their yeah. whole And, and brings yes. the nationalism in us, mm -hmm. yeah, patriotism in the country. So, so this is a good feeling, it's something new, we have not seen it before. So, well, congratulations, first lady. And the cause on is addressing the issue of maternal health care, yes. I think mm. that's a great cause. Thank you so much. And, and perhaps as, as African countries and as Africans generally, it's something we need to nurture more, as you yes. said, yes. is this feeling that we can all do something and be part of yes. contributing. Yes. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for Thank coming you. in. And I'm sure we'll be talking more. Asante Sana, yes. Najib. Thank you.